Hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Behtad Puran. I'm an application scientist at MI Labs, and I'm going to give a talk uh, in the ORS about multifaceted imaging of the musculoskeletal systems. So most of my slides will be dedicated to uh, osteoarthritis or applications in the, uh, when there is bone loss or if there is alterations in the bone structure. So I'm going to mostly cover it because that's the main theme of the conference. But I'm also going to spend a few slides on other interesting applications towards the end of my presentation. So there is several um, changes in the knee joint, and there there is a, a lot of causes that may uh, attribute may be attributed to the joint inflammation, to the structural changes of the bone, to the structural changes of the cartilage. For instance, in the osteoarthritis or in the rheumatoid arthritis. So um, these uh, will already start. Um, uh, initiating changes in the structure of the bone. Uh, we also have other types of diseases, very common diseases like osteoporosis. In the osteoporosis, uh, we commonly have uh, the loss of bone in several locations. As you can see, for instance, in this vertebral body, which is the healthy uh, status, uh, the, uh, the structure of the bone is quite normal, but as the osteoporosis uh, continues and becomes more severe, there is going to be loss of bone in several locations as pointed out to, uh, in here, which can later cause uh, detrimental effects on the mechanical strength of the bone. Also, traumas and fractures are very common. Not only it affects the elderly, but also it affects uh, the young population. Uh, for instance, due to mechanical injuries and uh, even sometimes due to the, to the cancer there is going to be gaps created between the two pieces of bone. Sometimes those gaps are quite big so that they don't heal by themselves. And as a result, in interventions are required. So those interventions can, can be, um, for instance, by placing a fixator or a scaffold to uh, facilitate the regeneration of the bone in the gap area. But what is in common between all those situations is that uh, we always have changes in the structure of the bone, in the morphology of the bone, and therefore we need imaging to study it and to understand the pathologies better. So there is several structural bone parameters. I'm listing them here. Uh, some of the most common ones are bone volume fraction, uh, which is the division of the bone volume to the tissue volume. We also have trabecular thickness trabecular spacing. Uh, basically, these three parameters are the most uh, popular parameters for the orthopedicians to see if there has been anything wrong with the bone structure and with the uh, morphology of the bone. But of course, there's other parameters. I'm trying to keep it uh, uh, complete here. But my, my uh, talk, when it goes over the evaluation of the bone architecture, would be mainly focusing on these three parameters. So this is an example of an osteoarthritic uh, joint. So if we have uh, an osteoarthritic or unhealthy joint, we will see that there is a definite differences in terms of a structure of the bone between uh, the unhealthy and healthy situation. If you look at the unhealthy situation, we can see that there is thickening of the subchondral plate, as well as obvious changes in the structure of the trabecula. For instance, uh, some of the uh, trabecula become uh, thinner or thicker. And as a result, it becomes important to image it well to be able to evaluate the state of the health of the tissue. This is another example of an in vivo application of mouse knee. Uh, here, the mouse was injected with a contrast agent which allows us to see the vasculature of the bone uh, very clearly. So as you all know, vasculature is a very fundamental element of the bone, which helps the bone grow, uh, growth. And also um, when in uh, tissue engineering, people are trying to keep uh, and generate more bone, vascularization is also one of uh, the very important parameters. So here we can see the vessels very well. And also over here, we can see the trabecular structure in the mouse knee. It's, a, it's quite a small 
uh, knee joint, of course, but we are still able to see the uh, structures, uh, tiny structures very well, as well as we can see the uh, cortical bone. So uh, as it comes to vasculature imaging, there has been uh, a lot of efforts and MicroCity has played a key role in several applications. Um, most of the time, uh, researchers inject the animal with a contrast agent that has long enough circulation in the blood. And as a result, uh, they can later segment the lumen path lines, like in this case, a study from Yale University published in Science Translation on Medicine, where they utilize the microcity data in order to generate this shear stress distribution throughout the um, arteries as well as the this this part where it had most uh, shear stress on it so with this they can really analyze the vasculature and this can become a very important tool also for um, uh, analysis of the bone because there is going to be a vascularization while bone forms um, so this study was a very interesting one, which was uh, published also as a cover story of the journal. And, uh, and of course, there has been other studies like the, this paper from Yale University published in Nature in 2019, where they focused on the pig brain. They were looking at the uh, structure of the vessels, the network of the vessels. So the... Uh, contrast agent allowed the visualization of the vessels and of course because the resolution is quite high we can actually resolve very tiny details there so um, so far i've shown some examples of parts of the body but we can of course do full body imaging um, in this case uh, in this example we can see a full body mouse which was injected with contrast agent uh, in this case, Exitron, which has a high um, blood circulation. Uh, and uh, we can see actually a lot of soft tissues like liver, heart, um, the, the vasculature, spleen, even the vasculature in the brain, as well as the vasculature in the bone, of course. So this is a very unique tool to allow us to study the full body of a of a mouse um, and uh, be later able to focus further on the different parts of the body like in the heart uh, here we can actually capture the fast motion of the heartbeat of a mouse uh, using the micro ct we can also um, see the structures very well like uh, left and right ventricle we can also see uh, further through papillary muscle, uh, atrium, left and right. And also later we can see that we can even uh, look at the pulmonary veins and arteries and so on. So this becomes a very important tool also for cardiovascular imaging. And uh, of course, it is worth to mention that this image was acquired uh, in, with the 4D mode of CT, uh, which is a, a gated image. So uh, we can also do uh, analysis on the brain. Uh, when the animal is uh, injected with contrast agent, we can even see the uh, blood vessels here. So this is a mouse brain. Uh, we can travel through, we can check the structures, and we can even um, create multiple projections and put them together to allow us see the angiogram of the brain, which allows us to see uh, the structures better uh, here. In this image, we can nicely see the tiny little structures here. And uh, therefore, it allows to do further quantifications, for instance, doing uh, vessel diameter analysis or knowing the abundance of the vessels in the, in the brain. So coming back to the direct applications for orthopedics, um, here is an example of human ex vivo sample. This is a thumb. We can see the different bones here, uh, the spacing between the bones, uh, the trabecular structure, the cortical bone. Uh, so uh, this is a very nice example to show that we can not only analyze the cortical bone, but we can also do a very accurate analysis on the trabecular region. Same is true when we're looking at the cervical spine. Uh, we can look at the uh, trabecular structure. We can look at individual uh, vertebral bodies. We can check the intervertebral disc and so on. So this can be a very nice multifaceted application for several orthopedics uh, uh, cases. 
Next, uh, of course, I would like to show that we can uh, scan bigger objects, um, uh, big animals. Uh, so here I'm showing a sheep femur. Uh, as you can appreciate, uh, we can nicely see the uh, trabecular structure and, uh, and actually we can see also the cortical bone very well. So in, in this example, I'm showing how we can analyze the trabecular structure. So, uh, and also the cortical bone. Here is the uh, micro CT image of a uh, mouse tibia and towards the right, we see that we can segment it very well. We can threshold it and then we can do further analysis. Uh, this time the analysis was, was performed on the trabecula and on the cortical bone thickness. And we can easily derive the distribution of the uh, uh, thickness throughout the bone. So there has been several studies looking at the effects of genetic modification on bone alterations, like in this case, uh, where people actually looked at the uh, trabecular uh, changes as well as the cortical changes. Uh, because there has been impaired mitochondrial uh, translation, which further led to the osteo, uh, decreased osteogenesis and also osteopenia in the mice. So as you can see, um, the um, uh, knockout mouse showed tremendous bone loss. There has been also changes in the uh, trabecular spacing, trabecular thickness, as well as bone mineral density. This was a very recent paper published in Cell Death and uh, Disease. And of course, when it comes to genetic disorders, here is a nice example seeing the uh, normal zebrafish with a normal jaw uh, as compared with a, a, a knockout gene zebrafish with, with a dislocated jaw here. So you can uh, see the difference uh, morphologically very well which actually was the purpose of this study to, to understand what effects it can have on the feeding behavior of the animal. So they could analyze the feeding behavior of the animal because of the changes in the jaw geometry. We can also look at other interesting structures. Uh, for instance, here we can see the mouse nasal cavity. Um, so this can serve as a reference for anatomy lessons or for uh, pathologists to understand the disease uh, progression. So it can have uh, different applications for different users. So my next slide is uh, more towards uh, applications uh, where uh, medium-sized animal imaging is important. Here, a rabbit was a scanned. Uh, the CT data on the joint level uh, was um, extracted, was reconstructed, and was fed into a model in order to see how femoral and tibial shortening would cause changes in the mobility of the knee joint. So here they could actually put uh, each individual uh, piece of bone uh, in, the, in the model and be able to simulate uh, the knee joint uh, and see what effects it, the shortening of the bones had study by University of South Wales uh, published also recently in Journal of Orthopedic Research. Uh, so of course, so far I've uh, talked mostly um, and showed images more on the organ and tissue level, but it would be fascinating to also look at a piece of mouse knee in this example, image with two different magnifications and of course resolutions. So the bottom image has a higher magnification and therefore resolution. On the top image, we can already uh, see a lot of features. Uh, we can see bigger holes uh, uh, on, the, on the bone uh, over here, which is a clear sign of uh, you know, a blood vessel. Uh, we can also see the trabecula. We can nicely see the cortex, but we can gain even further details if we look at the higher magnification image like this one. So if we zoom in, we would be able to actually see the little holes in there as well. And these little holes uh, can be indicative of the cells that can be imaged. So each of those holes can be a lacuna of a cell. Therefore, we will be able to not only image at the tissue and organ level, but also at the cellular level. 
So of course, uh, there is a lot of applications and they sometimes are very challenging and very important at the same time uh, when it comes to uh, bone implant contact measurements. Why are implants important? Because when the bone start to lose its uh, function and it needs more support, normally surgeons start to place prosthesis. Uh, prosthetic uh, crown over here is shown for tooth applications. Uh, they can also apply uh, porous scaffolds uh, for the fusion applications in, in the spine. Uh, so there is several applications uh, regarding the porous scaffolds and also in general metal scaffolds. But there is a challenge when we want to image it. Uh, for uh, it, it has been shown that CT scans of metals are in many times associated with uh, massive beam hardening that actually prevents accurate analysis on the structures around the implant. So it will be very difficult, as you can see in several examples. Over here, we see uh, streaking artifacts. We see a lot of a scattering. So basically, every structure around the implant becomes very difficult uh, to observe. But with our technology and uh, by using uh, optimal um, CT acquisition parameters, we were able to acquire very nice images and see the bone around the implant very well. And uh, for instance, this scan was done on the mouse jaw. We can see the implant itself, the bone surrounding the implant, and we can do all sorts of rendering. Uh, so this was a, an interesting example. The next example I want to show is when uh, we are actually looking at a piece of bone. Uh, there is a relatively large titanium implant here. You can see how bone meets the implant over here. So if I run the video again, we can see that we can even try to determine how much bone has formed near the titanium implant over here. And uh, I will show uh, a classic example of how we can do it and the uh, uh, strategies we have regarding that. So the analysis that I'm going to show was done with Emalytics Preclinical. Um, you can see over here that we have uh, defined three different classes, a class uh, that uh, assigns uh, the implant to, uh, um, to, to a green color. Then we have a class of bone, we have a class of no bone. So the idea here was to create a coding class around the implant and be able to determine the bone volume around the implant. So uh, we, if we want to gain more insight about this, we can look at this image. So in blue, we have the no bone. In, uh, in white, we have the bone. And over here, we have the coverage uh, of the implant by bone. So where there is bone is shown in white and where there is only bare implant, it is shown in light blue. So also here we can see it in 3D. Uh, how this works, and uh, and actually we can see how bone structure uh, is around the implant. So we can not only look at the uh, amount of bone, but also the, uh, at the structure of the bone. So we can determine then bone volume. We can determine uh, bone uh, no bone volume, and then by summing them uh, two, we will be able to determine how much volume we are analyzing. And by dividing the bone volume over the total volume of the analysis section, we will be able to say how much bone has formed and we can determine bone volume fraction. If we take the same piece of bone, we can do even further analysis. We can draw a region of interest, a volume of interest over here. And uh, we can actually look at the trabecular thickness. We can look at the trabecular uh, spacing uh, at both trabecular region and also at the cortical region. So we can look at the cortical thickness as well as trabecular thickness at the same time in this example. Then we will be able to determine bone volume, tissue volume. By division, we can have the bone volume fraction, uh, bone surface, um, a specific surface uh, of the bone, trabecular thickness and trabecular spacing. So basically with, uh, with this tool, starting from high resolution micro CT, we will be able to determine all sorts of uh, bonus structural parameters. 
So of course, uh, so far I've shown mostly orthopedic applications, but uh, of course it is interesting to also look at other types of applications, especially in this case, uh, tooth applications. Uh, what we see here is a common procedure called root canal. And in root canal, the cavity that is shown in blue is, uh, is attempted to be filled with a filling material so that it completely gets filled and there is no pores left. So this is the uh, ultimate hope of a surgeon or a dentist. But of course, when it comes to practice, because there uh, is several variations of uh, filling procedure, we can already see differences in terms of filling. So if you look at these four cases of tooth, we can see that there is uh, different pore sizes and different pore connectivities in there. So this is a micro CT scan. We can also uh, look at the pore anatomy here. So this is the pore anatomy of this spe specific tooth. And this is the pore anatomy of the other tooth. So we can actually analyze all pore, uh, and, uh, pore structure and we can even isolate those pores like this and look at each individual tiny little pore. And, uh, and then we can actually see how much connectivity there is because if they are more connected, probably it would allow more fluid to, uh, to flow through. And as a result, there will be possible degeneration of the tooth so it becomes a very important tool for the dentist to determine which type of filling procedure works best to eliminate uh, these pores as much as possible. So here I have a video uh, showing how we can actually reconstruct a full tooth. This is the NML. We can see the uh, topo topographic information here. We can actually travel through. We can probe the in inner structure of the tooth we can actually really nicely diagnose it. We can also see in this cavity near the cracks over here, uh, a lot of details. Also, we can have a fly through image here showing again uh, nicely the canal, the cracks that are in there. Those, those cracks may have occurred because of handling post uh, extraction. But anyway, the resolution is high enough to enable us uh, see the very tiny details over here. So after uh, saying a little bit about tooth imaging, I'm taking a step back to the orthopedics applications, but this time I would like to uh, emphasize the importance of inflammation and obesity and their effects on the osteoarthritis. So it's been shown in several papers, including these two seminal papers that obesity and inflammation play a big role in, the, uh, in driving the osteoarthritis. And as a result, it becomes important to not only look at the structure of the bone, but also to look at the molecular processes that are going on in the knee joint. So as I said, we need molecular processes information. So we can actually add a new element to our imaging uh, next to the micro CT, which in this case is a SPECT, to make it into molecular CT. And then it will allow us to see what is going on in terms of inflammation, for instance, in the knee joint. So if we look at this image, this is a, a rat knee and uh, the rat knee was uh, superficially uh, injured. And then the rat, uh, this rat uh, group was uh, having high fat diet. The other one had a standard diet and they've shown that hot, high fat diet can contribute to further inflammation. So we can actually capture the inflammation which is shown in this signal and together with the micro CT image which shows us what has gone wrong uh, structurally. Also, we can look at uh, the mouse knee here. Uh, we can look at the micro CT as the underlay image. Uh, and then if uh, we apply MDP, which is a specific to bone, then we can also analyze the metabolism of the bone. So with the SPECT, we can look at the molecular processes and with the CT, we can do a structural analysis, which both are extremely valuable to understand the um, onset of osteoarthritis and its progression. So we can also do total body bone imaging. So as you can see here, um, this was a scan done with MDP. 
the acquisition is extremely fast that allows to do dynamic study. So we can actually see live pharmacokinetics in the bone and also in the different organs. So we can plot the uptake in the different organs uh, because the scanner is fast and the resolution is high and sensitivity is high. So these all help to acquire these uh, interesting data. So uh, one interesting example about uh, capabilities of a SPECT is mentioned here. So it's been shown that coincidence PET, uh, if we do an imaging with uh, uh, on the knee joint, will only shoot to, uh, show two blobs. And these two blobs uh, are not detailed enough, of course, and each correspond to one of the bones. One, for instance, uh, femur, the other one, tibia. But if we do a SPECT uh, technology of a MyLabs and apply it to a knee joint of a mouse, we would be able to see several other features. So if you look at the SPECT image itself, you would still be able to see the anatomical features, the fibula here, tibia, femur, and the patella. So you can compare it with a CT scan and uh, we can nicely see a good match between, uh, between the different pieces of bone and the elements uh, for, with the SPECT and with the CT. So with the SPECT, not only can we see the structure, but also we can do further analysis on the molecular processes, of course. So I told this story because I wanted to get to this slide. Uh, this is a nice paper published from uh, University of Aachen. Uh, in Journal of Science Translational Medicine, they uh, were looking at the obesity and the fat. So they did uh, micro CT scans on the healthy mice and also on the infected mice. And uh, then they looked at the micro CT images, they started analyzing it. They were even able to differentiate between the two different fat types, visceral fat and subcutaneous fat and uh, they could do further analysis. In this case, they have shown that uh, infection can cause dysregulation of lipid metabolism, but of course, this can be directly applied to where we want to study osteoarthritis. Uh, we just need a CT scan, then we can determine the obesity, how much fat has formed, and then uh, make the association between the uh, the fat content and the uh, severity of the um, uh, joint disease. Another interesting example uh, related to bone imaging is when we want to treat bone cancer. So uh, researchers from Radboud University here, uh, they um, conjugated bisphosphonate, which is a bone seeking agent and has a high affinity to bone with uh, an isotope of platinum. Uh, so this isotope of platinum is able to generate gammas and Auger electrons. So with the SPECT, we can utilize the um, gamma, gamma rays and uh, basically get the signal and see where this uh, complex uh, has ended up. Uh, and of course, where it goes to, it starts uh, radiating the uh, tumor cells and can kill them. So it can be an excellent tool for both visualization of the bone and uh, for uh, treating bone cancer and killing the tumors. So um, many bone researchers, orthopedicians, and bone mechanics people, uh, et cetera, work very closely with their collaborators. So their collab collaborators can come from a different discipline, for instance, pulmonary, uh, cardiology, neurology, oncology, and etc. And they may actually form a consortium and they want to work together. Therefore, I uh, would like to actually show some other examples, not directly related to bone imaging, but they show the capabilities of the micro CT of MI labs. So one of the nicest examples is here uh, when we are looking at the lung and we want to determine how uh, much healthy the lung is. So here we see the long, healthy lung and here we see a, a lung with the tumors. You can clearly see the difference between the two. So the lung with the fibrosis or with the lung tumor shows clearly um, infiltration of the soft material and uh, it's very easy to actually see that on the CT images. So as you can see here. 
So uh, we can actually use CT to diagnose abnormality in the lungs and for pulmonary research. So if we take the next step uh, and look at this slide, we can see a nice application of bronchoscopy, but digitally. So here we are showing that using digital probes, uh, we can travel through the airways and detect any possible abnormalities in the uh, pulmonary system. So this was done in the mouse and a ferret, uh, showing us that uh, we don't need with the CT technology of MyLabs to necessarily put a physical probe and start checking the internal structures. We can simply take the CT scan and then look further through and detect any possible abnormalities. A relevant paper was published uh, recently by uh, Alabama, University of Alabama, and they were looking at the lungs of the ferrets, uh, especially to see the effects of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So here uh, they were looking at the lumen of bronchi and they were able to reconstruct the bronchi and uh, basically look at both the thickness and diameter and see how much uh, uh, problems uh, this type of disease uh, have inflicted. So, um, of course, respiratory gating is a fascinating tool that uh, we have. Uh, this would allow us to actually look at a specific phase within the respiratory cycle. So if we use those images, we can also suppress the blurriness due to motion. As you can see, we can obtain very sharp uh, diaphragm image here. So the interface between the liver and the lung is quite sharp here. So we can do a very detailed analysis on the lung because we have quite sharp images. So this is a very important tool, especially for pulmonary research and also for the cardiovascular research. Not only can we do the uh, respiratory gating on, on a single mouse, but we can also apply it to four mice simultaneously uh, as shown in this picture. So there is uh, four mice placed on the bed and then we can actually go to each of them and start observing their breathing pattern and we can do further analysis on each of the lungs. So this can be a very good tool for uh, non-invasive, completely non-invasive, because we are using no sensors here. We are just purely using the CT uh, projections to create these images. This can be also be very um, uh, important for applications where high throughput is demanding. So when it comes to multiple animal imaging simultaneously, I would like to show this example on liver metastases. So there has been four mice at the same time and the contrast of the liver was enhanced using contrast agent. And uh, this allows to actually see the individual metastases and we can take each of these uh, livers and look further and start segmenting the metastases and come up with this nice image showing the number of metastases, the volume, and we can also do further analysis on this image. Of course, so far uh, I've mentioned several applications of our CT, but uh, one unique application that we have and we really benefit from the CT technology is when we are doing 3D optical imaging. In particular, um, we, here I'm showing a paper on 3D fluorescent tomography where uh, people were um, looking at the uptake of a specific molecule. So uh, cross-linked polymeric micelles conjugated with a fluorophore and they were looking uh, whether this will reach the tumor at all. And they could actually very accurately determine the uptake of this molecule in the different tumors. As you could uh, probably know, uh, light scattering and absorption occurs during optical imaging. So we use uniquely CT prior information in order to correct for the optical absorption and the scattering in the different tissues, giving us the possibility to acquire very high resolution images uh, and uh, be able to analyze the different organs when it comes to a specific therapeutics. This uh, article was published by uh, Aachen University in Journal of Controlled Release lately. There has been an 
Another article similar uh, in terms of technology, uh, fluorescent tomography together with the CT, but this time it was utilized for glioblastoma drug development for brain tumors. So um, this technology is, is extremely accurate. It can even show the depth of the signal very well. If it is lower towards the jaw or if it is further up, uh, we can detect it. Here they also performed a verification study. So um, here uh, we see the CT image on the tumor and uh, the arrow shows it, another tumor. And we could see nicely how good the optical images were matching those uh, CT images taken as golden standard. Same is true when we are looking at the signal uh, in the brain between this image, optical image, together with the PET, and they show both uh, localization inside the brain because researchers were trying to um, uh, make the blood-brain barrier more permeable so that the drugs can reach the brain. This was also further confirmed by the 2D uh, fluorescent imaging. So the top image, of course, shows consistently no signal in the brain because there has been no molecule and no treatment to make the uh, blood-brain barrier permeable for the, for the therapeutics. A paper from Columbia University uh, published in Drug Delivery. And of course, there is uh, several other applications uh, with CT. Uh, this example is from University of Pennsylvania, um, where they actually broadened the application of CT and they basically used uh, three different uh, elements uh, to make it polymetal nanoparticle and they used gold, tantalum and cerium here and this allows to gain high contrast no matter at what x-ray energy we are imaging using the CT. So this is also an excellent uh, tool to um, um, broaden the application of CT imaging uh, this paper was uh, published in Chemistry of Materials, and then from the same group, they also did a study on the effect of gold nanoparticle size on enhancement of the contrast within the different uh, tissues. And uh, basically, uh, they, they published this paper in Scientific Reports in 2019, and, uh, and with this, of course, uh, I would like to go to this slide, and this slide shows uh, a piece of art. This is an 18th century Chinese ivory puzzle ball. It's a fully calcified ball. It has very beautiful patterns on its surface and also in, on its interior. But of course, you can hold it in your hand and start looking through and wonder how beautiful it is. But if you want to gain more insight of how many layers are in there and the two even better understand uh, the uh, structure, the in, uh, internal structure, uh, we can do a CT scan. So we did a CT scan. We could see the internal structure very well. We could also uh, see how many layers are in there. So we could count the layers and that a CT image gave us 19 layers. Um, and this is very fascinating to be able to image such a uh, highly calcified and mineralized uh, piece of art. So with this, um, I would like to conclude my talk, but of course, I would like to mention that there is several applications we can apply the CT technology and MI Labs uh, technology to, uh, for instance, orthopedics, uh, cardiovascular, oncology, uh, focused scans we can perform we can perform full body scans and also we can um, we can look at the different individual tissues and organs uh, do molecular imaging and uh, and if uh, you have any further questions please reach out to our team and uh, we are very ha happy to help you uh, with your applications thank you very much and i wish you a great day